Pray with me, please. Eternal God, our Father, and just want to thank you for the privilege of being here amongst the saints, Lord. Men and women, boys and girls who claim the blood of Jesus and those who may not know about the blood of Jesus. We just pray that right now, Lord, you will manifest yourself. Holy Spirit, manifest yourself right here, right now. Help me to die right now, Lord, so that the risen Savior can be seen. They won't see me. They will see him. We bless you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Because we pray it in the sweet name of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I only have 90 minutes here, so I'm going to keep this short. <laughs> um, by way of... Um, so to speak, commercial message. I want to first um, ask my wife to stand. There you go. You know, you know that, that saying that behind every good man, there's a surprise mother-in-law. Um, we, um, we're, we're becoming on 42 years of marriage this June. It's nothing but God's grace, you know. You, you, we can say, well, you did this right, you did this. No, it's grace. It's the grace of God. Because uh, there are times you, you know, those of you who have been married, you know, 42 hours, you know, before, <laughs> you know, you, you know, everything is sweet and kind. And, you know, you, you watch it, you, I didn't, you know, you watch each other get dressed. You say, I didn't know, you know. And, um, but God has been very kind and gracious to us. I, I was born and raised in Chicago. And um, my mom um, and my father, um, by the time I was three years old, they were, they were already divorced. And um, uh, he was an abusive father, as was my stepfather, and um, physically, verbally abusive. And um, so my mother had to raise the three of us in Chicago, and Chicago was just as violent then as it, as it is now. Um, and my father died. And the next time I saw him, I was 13 years of age. And in those days, we had uh, wakes. We had the, the wakes. The body was held in the home. And uh, so the next time I saw him, he's laid out in one of our cousins' home in a coffin. I hadn't seen him for those 10 years prior. And, um, but my mom uh, raised the, my brother, my sister, me in Chicago, persevered through that, and, uh, you know, we learned a lot about Jesus. We went to church. Uh, she dragged us to church. You know, we had the, that drug problem. And mom dragged you, drug you to church. And um, I knew a lot about Jesus. Um, but knowing him as my personal Lord and Savior didn't really happen till I was um, a junior in college. And I, when I went to college at, um, you know, at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, um, I had done all the things that I wasn't supposed to do. Like my dad, you know, I tried everything. And the um, Lord said, Michael, if you keep doing what you are doing, you're going to end up like your father at 30 and dead. And I said, Lord, well, that's not what I want. I, um, I said, if you are who you say you are, my mom had given me a Bible. I opened it at that time. And I said, Lord, if you are who you say you are, you can bring about some miraculous things in my life and I said but you know I'm going to need a wife that loves you more than she loves me like uh, because that way when she gets really mad at me and you husbands you know how that happens she get really really mad at me she will fix me my best meal and not my last meal <laughs> and she's had many occasions to fix me my last meal but here I am and so I, I got, um, I literally uh, finished uh, college at Lawrence University, uh, got accepted to University of Michigan, uh, where I did medical school. And my first year um, at medical school there, I was at a church called um, New Hope Baptist Church. And I went there looking for girls. I'll just tell you upright, I went there looking for girls. And I walked in this church and, uh, 
and Kay, Kay was standing at the front of the church making an announcement about the pastor's anniversary or something, and she stopped dead in her tracks when I walked through the door and said, she said, I want to marry him. <laughs> and if I'm lying, may lightning strike me right now. <laughs> That's how it happened. We got married um, a couple of years later, uh, moved here to Philadelphia uh, to do my training in general surgery. And um, at the end of uh, my training, uh, you know, we uh, did some short-term missions in Kenya, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, but let me di divert, di divert a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about a commercial break here. I want to talk to you about some things that are on our mission table there. And I know you have your women's uh, breakfast on this same day, but we have a conference called Ask the Doctors Anything. All right? And here it says here, Bring your questions, your suggestions, your pills, your potions, your x-rays, your CDs, your salves, and your herbs. Bring them all. We have experts on nutrition, diabetes, medication, immunizations, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, stroke, seizures, behavioral health addiction, sexually transmitted disease, COPD, asthma, hepatitis, intestinal disorders, and whatever you can name. We're going to have them there on this day. Uh, it's a conference uh, featuring a whole lot of doctors and pharmacists and, and the variety of specialties. May, 9th, uh, May 18th uh, from 9 o'clock a.m. to 1 p.m. at Christ Baptist Church. You, and um, you want to get that flyer and, and advertise it around uh, amongst your, your uh, colleagues and friends. The other thing there, you'll find our, our latest newsletter entitled Success in the Killer Zip Codes. We, Marion Medical Clinics is, is uh, located in one of the killer zip codes. And really, the killer zip codes, your life expectancy is determined by where your zip code is. And uh, so we, I quote here an article about um, where Marion Medical Clinics is and where we're, where we're located, the people that we care for. We care for people who have uh, been abused, who have uh, been abused, abusers of themselves, abusers of others, uh, been in, in very difficult situations. Um, you know, and hypertension and uh, diabetes and all these things are really impacted by not just your lifestyle, but where you live. And so that's where Miriam Medical Clinics is. And we, we care for people who, um, who don't have health care. And again, that information is there on the, on the table. Or who have health care, but their copay is too high. They can't afford to see their doctor. They don't like their doctor. Uh, we've been operational now for five years going on. All of our physicians and, and uh, pharmacists and nurses uh, are all volunteer. So we don't charge people. If you, have, if you have insurance, we will charge that. But if you don't have insurance, it doesn't really matter to us. We will provide care for you. If you know of anyone in the healthcare field or in um, you know, any, any administrative field, anything, we, we need volunteers. That's how we keep running. We, we pay our own malpractice. We pay our own liability. And uh, so we, we need help. So if you, if you know of someone or if you yourself know of anybody involved in health care or in health care administration, send them our way. We need the volunteers to continue this uh, at Miriam Medical Clinics. That information is there. You'll find an article entitled, Be Ashamed to Die. Be Ashamed to Die. And Martin Luther King quotes uh, um, uh, a, a, an educator who says, Be, be ashamed to die and, until you have done something worthwhile for mankind. Be ashamed to die until you've impacted someone's life uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. We should be ashamed to die. And lastly, you'll find my book um, called Making the Blind Man Lame uh, about cultural and racial imperialism and missions. And, and I just said it's cultural as well because I was in Kenya for 20 years, my wife and I, and um, I did things that had nothing to do with Jesus. I helped make the blind man lame because I crippled them with my own bias on what Christianity is. And uh, so making the blind man lame, just about our, our work there in Kenya over those uh, 20 plus years. And so there are a lot of ministries that, that you'll see there on the table. We'll be at, you know, at, at lunch to discuss these with you. But for now, I want to show you the word about leaving our first love leaving our first love and there in Revelation 2 that verse that I that really want to focus on nevertheless verse 4 I have somewhat against thee 
because thou has left thy first love. We've left our first love. And, I, and to me, that's, that's the key of um, where we stand in, in, in the American, as the American church. You could say the church in general is that we've left our, our first love. Uh, we have compromised the gospel of Jesus Christ for, 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 this, for things that are comfortable to us, things that are, are, are uh, culturally uh, cul comfortable to us, things that have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because we've compromised that, people aren't coming to see the Lord because all they're seeing is us. They see us, they don't see Jesus. Next slide for me. So I'm gonna get back to getting back to basics, getting ridding ourselves of the clutter and the clatter of culture. Uh, people can't see Christ because we have all of these other things on us. And what people need to see is Jesus. That's what they need to see. They don't need to see you know, more of us. Next slide. Our business is to pre present the Christian faith not in modern terms, not clothed in modern terms, but to propagate it, the modern thing, clothed in Christian terms. So, so what we've done is we, we, we've crafted it so that we um, made Christ look like us instead of us looking like him. That's what we've done. So, you know, and, I, and I'm guilty of this. When, in, when we go, when we were in Kenya, you go and you, you, you have all this stuff. You, you know, when missionaries used to go, they used to carry all their belongings in their casket because they didn't expect to return. They were just going. Now, I, when I got there, we, we carried all our belongings in a container. And uh, life didn't begin until we, till we got our microwave and we got our marshmallows. And, and so the, the message was, you know, well, if you're a good Christian, the message that, the, I didn't mean to send this message, but I recognize that that's the message that I sent. If you're a good Christian, you get to get all the stuff that I got. If you're a good Christian, and I'm going to people that are impoverished, people that are struggling to meet their daily needs for food and clothing. And I'm presenting them Jesus Christ, the one who can not only save you, but also get you a big refrigerator. That's the cultural norm that I, that I presented when I was in Kenya. So David Platt, in his book Radical, says we want to revisit our primary purpose and call. I don't know if any of you read the book Radical. It's an absolutely great book. When we were coming back from Kenya after our, uh, 2010, I read a New York Times article review on this book. And uh, anytime the New York Times gives a good review on a Christian book, I said, this has got to be a good book. They, re they, they gave a great review of this book. He says, we're going to revisit our primary call. And we're going to define our drift by the seducing world talk about the consequences of our drift and how to get ourselves back on track. David Platt is a, is a Southern Baptist uh, preacher. And um, that's, that's what we're going to do here today. So again, next slide. Uh, we, were, we are still with World Gospel Mission. That's our sending agency. That's the agency we went to uh, when we first went to Kenya. And I didn't tell you how we, how we got there. You know, we... Um, after I finished my residency, after those uh, five years of general surgery training, an interesting thing about general surgery, uh, well, even my, my last two years in medical school, the last two years in medical school are quite st stressful because they're clinical years. And uh, so you don't spend much time at home. Then I went into general surgery training, the, and the first uh, year I was here at Graduate Hospital at Un University of Pennsylvania. And um, the first uh, year is every, um, every other night call and they said that, they said the only thing wrong with every other night call is you miss half the good stuff in other words they want you to take call every night um, but every other night call and then from that every third night call and then in your chief year it's every night call and so it's really you don't really get a lot of family time and so um, you know well I got some family time because we did have four kids so, <clears throat> but my, my wife, uh, Kay, you know, she'd 
persevered through those years in medical school, through those years in surgery training. And um, at the end of that, I said, look, um, you've just been wonderful. And uh, you can go anywhere. Let's go to vacation. You go anywhere you want. Just pick, pick a spot on the map. You can go to Bahamas and, you know, wherever. News, you know, wherever you want to go. And so she got a, all these brochures and things of exotic places to go. And I came home with a thing from World Medical Mission about going to Congo, going to Zaire. And I said, look, sweetheart, it's dark people. They have palm trees. It's warm. It'd be just like Jamaica. <laughs> I, had, I didn't have a job. I had just finished my training, and my wife said, sure, let's do it. And um, we, uh, that was in 1984. Just finished my training. We went to Zaire, went to the Congo. Now it's called the Congo. Went to Zaire, and we spent my, my we'd never talked about missions. Never, 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 never talked about missions when I was courting, when we were married. Never talked about missions. I, hadn't, I had not met a missionary. But something, when you open that Bible, that Bible's a dangerous book. <laughs> you open that Bible and the Lord says, go ye. And they say, well, go where? <laughs> he said, go. And so we left our kids um, here with um, Kay's sister in Philadelphia. She came to babysit for us uh, those seven weeks we were in Zaire. And uh, the Lord started to break our heart for missions. Now let me tell you, that is... Zaire is not, you know, is not, is, even, you talk about Haiti, we were in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the, the plane, when we got, on a, we got on a plane, the plane was about this little bit bigger than this, this podium here. They have to weigh you before you get in the plane. You know, your, your wife does not want to get weighed, okay, not in front of you. <laughs> they had to weigh you, you know. And um, so we, we the plane buzzes the airstrip and cattle are on the thing, you know, you can't land and all that stuff. And um, we were there for seven, seven weeks in Zaire. And um, there the Lord break, broke our heart for missions. I'd never been, in, I'd never been in Africa. And that's where the Lord broke our heart for missions. We came back home and, um, and we opened up our practice of general surgery. And... Um, just started getting busy here in Philadelphia, just doing what, you know, I told the Lord I wanted a big practice, be a big time doctor in a big city, have lots of patients. Lord said, I have a lot of patients for you back there in Africa. <laughs> At three years of um, practicing, the Lord spoke to my wife and said, you need to go back. We did a second trip to Kenya, 1987. And the Lord said, this is where you're going to be. Came back, closed the practice. You can go to the next slide. And uh, that's what we did. We moved from, from Philadelphia to Beaumet. And, uh, you, you know, it's, um, it's a big move. I mean, you, you all remember the next slide. You all remember Green Acres, right? <laughs> it's, you, had, you know, you, tell, you, know, you got Eastern Standard Time and Central Standard Time and you had to set your, you didn't have to set your watch back, you had to set your calendar back. We went from big, big city to places where there, we, the bank, the bank in Beaumet, they had a bank. The bank in Beaumet would close on cloudy days because the, the light, they had, they had um, sunroofs to get the light in. You couldn't count because there's no light. The cloudy day, there's no light. We, we had a phone when we first got to Beaumet. You all remember the, you would crank the phone, and that's the phone. Now, they've, they've advanced significantly since the time we were there, but that's what, I, what our family was going through in 1987. When we, in 1989, when we moved to, when we moved to uh, Kenya. But the Lord uh, blessed us in that, and uh, we, we, I went there as a surgeon. Kay uh, worked as, um, and still works in, in the capacity of, building um, the uh, hospital computer system, the billing system. And um, we moved from, from that hospital to uh, at Tenwick. We went to Kajabi Hospital, ended up in Nairobi for our last uh, uh, several years there in, in Kenya. And all the time, 
I, as I said, I went there as a surgeon. That's all I wanted to do. But the Lord had other things for us to do. Next slide. And so we got involved in outreaches within the cities, within the city slums, in the, in the rural districts. We, would, we did um, famine relief. We built schools. We, we worked with orphanages. Next slide. Um, we did a ministry called The Least of These, where we worked with kids that are on the street. There are literally tens of thousands of children and families living on the street. And uh, I'm sure you've seen those um, videos and those things on television of how people are living on the streets. And, and because kids, um, just like here, children just like here, they're, they're living in some very dire situations. They're even more dire there because the parents don't have the means to feed them. There, there is no safety net. There is no welfare. There is no chip. There is no... Uh, there is nothing like that. And so we were taking care of kids on the street and in orphanages. We, we provided health care, education, clothing, and food for tens of thousands of orphans in Nairobi. We did immunization clinics. We did all of this stuff. I went there as a surgeon, Lord. I said, I, I had none of this in mind. Lord said, this is what you do. Now, and, and Kay, of course, was the one who oversaw uh, the, the administration of these things. Uh, I, I say, <clears throat> I'm the smart one. She married me because uh, she married down. I married, I married up. You got to, you know, we had more than we can handle, but the Lord always provided the increase. You, Germantown Christian Assembly, has always been a part of what we've done. And I want to thank you for what you've done. You, you've, you've walked with us through, through all of these ministries over these years, and uh, you're, you, so you're familiar with the, with the least of these ministries. We did another ministry that the Lord gave us called um, uh, A Prepared Place. In A Prepared Place, we worked within Kenya to provide uh, for the orphans of Kenya to be adopted by Kenyans. Because, you know, there are a lot of international agencies taking children out of Africa and taking them to other places. And, but the majority of those kids get left behind. Probably 99.999% of them are still there in Kenya. Their parents have died from AIDS, they died from wars, they died from natural disasters. So what we did is we worked with uh, orphanages there in Kenya to um, help us place children in Kenyan homes. And we called that a prepared place. You know where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you? Well, you can talk a child all day about, I have a place for you in heaven. You know, that thing of some pie in the sky by and by, but right, I need some ham where I am. <laughs> and so we were able to get Kenyan Christian families to take children who were orphaned and abandoned and who had not the, did not have a love of a family. We visited one of those uh, families where we had placed a child and this, this, this couple took this child in there, a good Christian couple, and the little boy, we're visiting him, and he says, that's my cow over there, and that's my goat over there. The little boy just come right in, just like we do. The Lord says, I prepared a place for you. And he says, oh yeah, that's my street of gold over there. God has taken us in, a prepared place. God has prepared a place for us and these children. We also did a lot of other things. You can go to the next slide. We did uh, training. We, the Lord allowed us to start training programs in Kenya. Uh, we worked with uh, several mission hospitals, started the internship program. Now, what happens um, is f uh, physicians and nurses and teachers from all of these nations, all these African nations, Caribbean nations, what happens is the World Bank subsidizes their education. All right? The United States is part of that. We subsidize their education. And then they get paid so little that they come over to the United States to get their training. When they get to the United States, they don't go home. They don't go home. And so what we're doing is we are part of the brain drain. Now we know that they're staying. We know that. But rather than incentivize them to stay home, we just accept that. And so we are part of the problem of the healthcare uh, disparity in those countries. There are, there are countries in Africa, for most of the countries in Africa, 
where the physician to patient ratio is one to 500,000 or one to, or one to, you know, one to almost a million in many, especially with regard to surgeons, literally one to a million, one surgeon for a million people, one surgeon or one doctor for 500,000 people. So we were involved in getting the training programs there in Kenya. And we started uh, the, the internship process for physicians and then we rolled over into beginning a program called InfoMed, Institute of Family Medicine, where family physicians are trained in Kenya, and now it's being trained by Kenyans. It used to be all Americans that are doing training, now it's Kenyans training Kenyans. Because what happens is, if you come over here and you do your training, and you learn all of this high-tech you know, gene therapy and in vitro fertilization and uh, 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 magnetic resonance and geography and you go back there and you know you're just trying to find clean IV fluid you're trying to find the correct dose for malaria all of this training that you have here you're frustrated you go back home so people don't want to go back home they want to stay here our training programs are designed to keep people where they are so that they can minister to people where they are um, that, that's, that's that program. Then I talk about, go to the next slide, the, the, a prepared place. So we place children in Kenyan homes um, with, Kenyan, with loving Kenyan families. Uh, next slide. So this is, um, we, we provided uh, drip irrigation. We, we provided communities with, uh, that had uh, no uh, irrigation. So you go, to these, you go to these rural areas and you've seen rural areas in Africa. We worked in, in a place called uh, Ukambani, where uh, people walked miles and miles and miles for water. In fact, the majority of the time uh, that a woman spends during the day is running, going to get water and coming back home to carry the water. And the, and the frightening thing about that is that we know that they're, they're getting water that is contaminated. I mean, it's dirty water. And so, you know, we say, well, why don't you boil the water? And they look at you like, hey, look, I walked 10 miles to get this water. You want to boil it, half of it's going to evaporate. So what we did, the Lord gave us the resources to provide wells in communities. And I don't know, we put in have about a 10, 10 or 12 wells in communities. In addition, we were able, with the help of the Rotary, to um, get, uh, build a water catchment area. We got water out of the hills, up in the hills, and... Um, Water, uh, we provided the piping, the, po the um, what is that, the PVC piping to bring the water out of the hills, put it in these massive reservoirs, and, um, and people could come to that reservoir and get water. And then so between the piping and the reservoirs, I'm a surgeon, I'm not supposed to be doing this stuff. <laughs> so we were able to do that. Drip irrigation, we were able to provide fa uh, families. You see, Kay, you see Kay with that pump there, and she's uh, spraying some vegetables there. My wife became a farmer, you know, that's like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but the Lord helped us to do drip irrigation. So we were able to help build community gardens. Literally hundreds of uh, families now have community gardens. They no longer uh, go hungry during, during, the, uh, the, during the dry seasons. Uh, we did famine relief. We provided tens of thousands of tons of food. When, when, when there was famine in those, in those countries, we made an appeal to churches here in the United States. You provided us with money to buy, I mean, literally truckloads. They call it lorry, lorry loads of food. And they would go up in the country, and we would see to the distribution uh, of tons of food. Um, so, and again, um, next slide, we... we um, we provided shoes, we built schools, we built clinics. I went there as a surgeon. I'm not supposed to be doing all this stuff. <laughs> you remember um, Elisha, when um, the woman had the child and, and uh, the child died, and he says, Gehazi, go take that staff and lay it on the child, and the child still was dead. And the Lord said, look, I want you to go. So when I, when I got involved in missions, I was telling the Lord, well, look, I mean, when I first speaking to him, I said, Lord, look, I'll just send a big check. The Lord said, no, I don't want a check. I want you to go. If you go, I will take all the resources. And so we personally, when you pray for a missionary, the sincere prayer is this. This is the sincere prayer. Because you cannot pray sincerely for a missionary. You can't pray for God's perfect will to be done in my life 
if you won't let him have his perfect will in your life. Here am I, Lord, send him. You cannot ask God to do something in my life. So it means you got, doesn't mean you have to go to Africa. Doesn't mean you have to go to Haiti or Honduras or, you know, you know mean, but you have to be willing. God wants his perfect will in your life. So these are all the things. We, we bought shoes, we did immunization, a lot of things in those 20 plus years. Clinics, healthcare, next slide. And uh, these are all the things that the Lord allowed us to do. But I wanna get back to basics, next slide. I'm gonna get back to basics, you know. What are we supposed to be about? What is the Lord called us to do. You know, when we look at our United States, these United States, and we, we consider all the political controversy about, you know, health care and welfare and all the rest of that stuff, the Lord never told the government to visit the prisoners. He never told the government to feed the hungry. In fact, that is our mandate. That's our mandate. So we, we get all upset about what the government's not doing. That is our job. We will be held accountable. The Lord's not going to come back and say, well, you know, why didn't the president do such and such? No, the Lord's going to say, why didn't you? Why didn't you? It was your mandate. I gave you that commandment. So back to basics. Is I want to talk about the right motive. The motive is Jesus. The motive, you know, we have all these humanitarian organizations, Doctors Without Borders, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, World Bank. Those are, and their, their motivation is different from our motivation. Their motivation is a humanitarian thing. You know, the UN, UNICEF, um, the, um, all, all of these organizations, different. The, the, the Clinton Foundation, the, the Bill Gates Foundation, their motivation is different. Our motivation is Jesus. Only Jesus can change the hearts of mankind. The right motive? Jesus. The right message? He loves us. That's the message that Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. You, you know that song. Um, he's got the whole world. You know that song? In his hand, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. Now, I'm going to put a spin on that. I'm going to put a spin on that. He's got the hookers and the pimps. In his hands, he's got the hookers and the pimps. In his hands, he's got the, he's got the dealers and the users. In his hands, he's got the whole... Because if he doesn't have them in his hands, why does he have me? The message is love. Oh, that's, it. That's, it. that's the message. Oh, that's it. He loves us. Yes, Doesn't matter what country, what you look like, what you do. Yes, he loves us. That's the message. The motive is Jesus. The message is love. Yes. And the method is surrender. That's the method. That's the method. Like that. And so as we, as we move on, the... Um, You know, we get it back to basics. You know, we, we have to look at this. Now, next slide. We got to get back to basics. We are completely off message. We have these idols. I don't know which idol you're worshiping. We've allowed the world to split us into right and left and who's right and who's wrong, who's liberal and who's conservative. The message is about Jesus. The church has got to get back on message. We are never going to be able, we're never going to get serious about missions if we're divided. You hear me? We're never going to get right on, on the message. And so the, the um, next slide. The church must be reminded Next slide. 
Martin Luther King said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide of, and critic of the state and never its tool, never its tool. And it, what we're seeing, what we're experiencing now in America is no different from any other time in history. I mean, the reason that there, there nobody going to church in France is because the church got so involved with, with the royalty that when they took down the royalty, they took down the church. Um, the, the same thing happened in Russia. When they took down the royalty, they took down the, took down the czar, they took down the church. Um, so this is not a new phenomenon. But we have to be careful not to wed ourselves closely to the state because the state only has one thing, and that's to stay in power. That's their whole purpose. So when a politician says, I'm born again and I love Jesus, his whole purpose is to stay in power. It is not to proclaim Christ. I say he or she. We are to set the tone. We are to set the moral guide. And so when, when we, we get off message, because we, we, we want power. We want to be in with the people of power. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this world. So we, next slide. What has happened is we have equated these two. We're in America, we've equated the Constitution with the Ten Commandments. That's a sin. Yes. Yes. One thing you have to do the, ten, the, 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 the Constitution, what does it have to be? Every once in a while it has to be amended. Nobody amends the Ten Commandments. Amen. It is what it is. I am who I am. Not to keep amending and second guessing. And first we have prohibition. Oh, no, we don't have prohibition. Then we have slaves. Oh, slavery is wrong. You can't vote. Oh, now you can vote. You have to keep amending. You never have to amend the Ten Commandments. It's God's word. So what happens is, next slide, people get all confused. The world is confused because we don't present a proper picture of who God is. What's the difference between Mormons and Jehovah's Witness and Baha'i Faith and Christian Universalists and Unitarian Universalists and Islam and Shintoism? And the world can't tell the difference because we don't present a clear message. And that message is love. That message is Jesus. That message is, it's all about him. Next slide. And so that's what it is. The world is distracted by our conflict. How are we going to proclaim to the world that Jesus is Lord when we can, that he's, he's, our ministry is reconciliation when you're not talking to the person on the next bench next to you? When you've got a whole list of people that I'm not talking to him, I'm not talking to him. You don't have to like me, but you, have to, you do have to love me. And that love is expressed in forgiveness, forbearance, uh, you know, you, in fact, you can't love unless you can forgive. It's impossible. There's no, po no way in the world. Because love is about forgiveness. How, I don't know how my wife has stayed with me this long. She's forgiven me a whole lot. <laughs> but that's love. Love is about forgiving. We don't forgive. And that's the message. Conf Christians in conflict. How are we going to talk about anything? So here we are. Next slide. God bless America is not in the Bible. It's not there. It's not there. I don't care how many times a politician says it or whomever says it. It's not the Bible. Pray for your enemies is there. Pray for them that despitefully use you. When they caught Osama, when they killed him, I was praying, man, I hope he finds Jesus before the Marines find him. We were applauding the death of a man whom God created. We are applauding his death. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us. We can't applaud the death of someone. Next slide. Our divided message unites the enemies of Christ. And we get caught up in this mayhem. Our divided message unites the enemies of Christ. 
Well, that, that, I don't have to join a church to hate people. I can hate people without joining a church. I can do that very easily. Next slide. The American Baptist Church. You know, the American Baptist Church is it's peculiar. You know, it, the only, um, it was united in the colonial war, in the colonial era, is divided at the Civil War. The only reason the Southern Baptist Church exists is because they wanted to protect slavery. That's their whole purpose. That was their thing. I mean, they're the biggest Protestant denomination in, uh, in America today. They're, on, they're having their own struggles right now with sexism and having to renounce slavery. In fact, they didn't denounce slavery until 1995. That's, that's just last week. <laughs> they, they, they held up with apartheid. They were pro-segregation. They were pro-Jim Crow. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. And June 2017, they just, just now denounced the alt-right movement. Lord have mercy. That's just, that's just yesterday. We have to be very careful. Next slide. So, we don't need a Christian America. We need American with the genuine Christians. And so, and so um, Russell Moore, another Southern Baptist uh, writer, these guys are shaking up the Southern Baptist Church, David Platt and Russell Moore. He says, our end goal is not a Christian America. That illusion is over and happily so. Some sectors of religious activism are willing to receive as Christians, heretics, demagogues, so long as they are with us politically. It's on the right and the left. There are some things that happen in, in, on both sides of this political spectrum that, um, that just make me wanna not vote at all. You know, you, don't, you say, we don't have a good choice. Well, we ne we've never had good choices. And I, and I don't believe that the Lord has said you're gonna have good choices, but you do make a choice. You know, the Lord can take, what does it say, take a crooked stick and head a straight lick? So you can vote for a crooked guy. God is, God is going to bless me not for, not so much for the choice I make, but for the motivation that I made that choice. Because you got, you got two evils, you know, well, Lord, this is the, like this, like this. And the Lord is going to bless my heart because I make it out of a right motive. That's all. There, so just, you know, you always have to close your eyes and pick. Okay, we're not looking for a Christian America. Next slide. We're looking for Americans that are genuine Christians. Next. So here we go. You know, we, we have to recognize Isaiah 114. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am, I am weary of them. We have some traditions that have overwhelmed our, our Christianity. I mean, when I was in Kenya, um, it's frightening how, how they took on all the things that, that were American that had nothing to do. I don't know why you would have s snow and sleigh bells in, in, in tropical Africa. I, I don't get it. <laughs> but they did. You go there and they'd have a Santa Claus singing the Yellow Rose of Texas. I mean, what sense does that make? The Yellow Rose of Texas in Nairobi, Kenya. And he'd be Santa Claus and he'd be but we've taken all of these things that, that are American and put it in there and people can't see Christ because they keep seeing me. They can't see Christ because they keep seeing America. And um, we, we, need to, we need to watch this. We need to watch this. You know, uh, next slide. The, the, the African American church. You know, I love black history. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, Carter G. Woodson instituted that, uh, the first Black American Week, Black American History Week, and then it became African American History Month, and that, that's wonderful. We need to celebrate that um, because we've been denied anything that's, you know, we, that made any strong contribution to this nation. 400 years of free labor, that's a pretty good contribution. 
free. I heard somebody say that America was built on capitalism. No, America was built on free labor. The, 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 slave, the, the South had the slaves and they, the, the North had the banks and owned the boats, owned the ships that brought them over, owned the insurance companies. They're all involved. But we have to recognize that the African-American church, such as it was, we, we, we celebrate our escape from slavery. We, the church literally was an environment of safety. Now, the you, Church of the Brethren doesn't do this so much, but our churches are... are our, our Baptist churches still do this. You know, I stand up in a church there in South Philly and I'll say, I'm Deacon Michael Johnson and I'm from this church and this is my pastor. And that tradition comes from the fact that an African-American, you've seen the movie, uh, what, 13 Years a Slave, I think it was? What is it called? 12 Years, okay, 12 Years. All right, I didn't watch it close enough. And, and the man got pulled back into slavery. Well, the reason... Um, you have to make all those identifications when you stand up in churches is that you didn't have the, you, you could be dragged back into slavery at any time. So you had to carry your manumission papers, you had to carry your baptism papers, you had to, you had to identify yourself if you were caught on the road and uh, so you had to stand up and say I'm, I'm from such and such church and such and such pastor. You had to be able to do all of those things. Didn't guarantee that you wouldn't be dragged back in but at least you had a chance. And so the church for, for African Americans was a safety because you didn't have anybody else to stand by you. And so African American church, you know, all of our, all of our leaders early on were pastors because the only, only black person who was allowed to read was a preacher. The only time you could gather together was in church. Otherwise you're forming rebellion and all the rest of that stuff. So the African American church, environment of safety, an advocate for civil rights, but now it's dying because we have no mission except to ourselves. All we talk about is home missions. And unless we reach out, we're, we're, it, it's going to be dead. Let's go on to the next, next slide. The next slide, you know, tradition is truth, but it's not truth. The, the European American church came as an escape from religious um, intolerance. That's why, they get, that's why they came to this church. They're the dominant culture. Therefore, white is right and white is might. Dying to itself because, dying to self-righteousness because they're the dominant culture. Until the white church, till the evangelical church, whatever you want to call it, recognizes that they have to get out of themselves, they will continue to die. Mainline churches are dying. And so, next slide. We have these three crosses. You know, you got one on the right, one on the left. You got the pro-life, the pro-death penalty, pro-drones, pro-anti-euthanasia, pro-gun, anti-safety nets for the poor, anti-global warming science. And then on the left, you got pro-choice, anti-death penalty, pro-gambling, pro-gay rights, pro-animal rights, pro, pro, you know, you got right and the left, they're both sinners. Both sinners. There's one cross, the Savior. So as we argue these, next, next slide, as we argue our points of difference, people are drowning. As we focus on self and don't go out to the world with the united message that Jesus saves, people are dying. Next slide. These are the real issues. World hunger. Endless wars. Sexual slavery, human trafficking, natural and man-made disasters. This is what the world needs. They don't really care about the next gun rights bill. They don't care about that. They're not really interested in that. They're, they're not really interested in, in whether you have a, a transgender bathroom. The world is not, that's not what the world needs to know. They need to know that Jesus loves them. We're getting sidetracked. And the world, we're allowing the world to do that. We're, we're settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is about abandoning ourselves. This is some next slide. These are some scenes of 
women and children. You see that child there getting water. One of our missionaries took this picture and getting water from this same place where the, the elephants get their waters and the lions get their water and all the bugs and diseases and feces and urine of animals. And you hope that child makes it home that the hyena doesn't catch him getting water. These are the issues that people are facing. They're, they're, they're really, really, really not concerned about the, the AIDS activists and sanctuary cities. They're not concerned about that. That's not what's on their mind. Getting back to basics, replacing the American dream, next slide, with the vision that Christ has for the world. Jesus did not die to save capitalist democracy. He did not die to save free market enterprise, save the welfare state, provide better schools, do nation building, or save the stock market. That's not why Jesus died. He did die to reconcile all things to himself. That's why he died. He died to glorify the Father. And, and, and you know, last but not least, I say this, if, if the Father said, come off the cross, Jesus would have had to get off the cross. But the Father said, die. Jesus was obedient. So, in being obedient, that's how he saved me. How do we get back on track? Next slide. <clears throat> we recognize that we are servants of the Most High. We are one body, one body, called for one purpose. We are not to be divided by politicians, denominations, social economic issues, ethnic or race. Oh, those things are not divide us. We are one body in Christ. If we want to carry this message to the world, if we really want to be serious about missions, we have to recognize that we are one body in Christ. Get off of this message of all this other stuff. So, next slide. The goal of this pro proclamation today. I'm, I'm not your preacher. I'm a proclaimer. Revisit our primary purpose and goal, define our drift by the seducing world, talk about the consequences of our drift to ourselves and to the world, and define how we can get back on track. Next slide. We shall never be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, except we know that we assuredly have no righteousness of our own. We have all this self-righteousness. We worship this way. We serve this way. We have this many candles. We worship on Saturday. We worship on Sunday. We have prayer service on this. We have no righteousness. We have no righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own. Any righteousness that we have is of him. A man asked me, he says, well, you know, do the poor deserve? Do the poor deserve our help? You see men and women on the street, do they deserve me rolling down my window and giving them something? Are they deserving? Well, who deserves? If, if, it's, if, it's, if it's by deserving, it's not grace. If I deserve it, it's not mercy. It's not mercy. If I deserve it, that's, that's earning. Love that we have of the Lord is not an exchange process. We, we don't love him because he does. He doesn't love us because he loves us even though. He doesn't give us grace and mercy because we deserve grace and mercy. He gives us grace and mercy even though. He loves us even though. We have no righteousness. Next slide. We will be held accountable. Matthew 28, 19. Depart from me. I was hungry. You never fed me. You didn't take me. Matthew 25, 31. Depart from me. I never knew you. But Lord, I did a whole lot of stuff. Lord, I was in missions. I, was, I, served, in the, I served on the usher board. Lord, I sang in the choir. Lord, I preached. I, I, never, I never knew you. 
I never knew you. As a church, we need to get back on message. Next slide. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Our first love is Jesus. Amen. First, yes. foremost, and finally, it's always about Jesus. Thank you, Germantown Christian.